Let's talk about a physical law that allows human beings to use electrical devices. This law is the reason why we can enjoy gadgets and other appliances that runs through electricity. This law is the basic reason why the human race can generate electricity out of nature. And I'm talking about Faraday's law of induction. This law states that a voltage is induced in a loop whenever there is a time rate of change of magnetic flux through the loop. Mathematically speaking, the voltage or EMF produced by the time rate of change of flux, symbolized by E, is equal to the time derivative of the magnetic flux. Now, if you have n number of loops, their effect is additive. Hence, if we have n number of loops, then we simply need to multiply this term with n. The negative sign in this relationship has a special meaning and later I'll explain this negative sign. Before we continue, I've rewritten the Faraday's law here and recall that if you have an area like this one, it has a measurable area, notice that the area vector can point in two directions. The positive vector area can point in this way or it can point this way as long as it is perpendicular with our area. Since magnetic flux is equal to the dot product of the magnetic field vectors and the area vector, then the sign of magnetic flux is actually dependent on the chosen area vector. So for example, initially, the external magnetic field passing through this current loop points this way. And initially, your area vector for this current loop points this way, then obviously, their dot product will lead to a positive magnetic flux. Otherwise, if the chosen area vector is anti-parallel with the external magnetic field, then obviously your magnetic flux is negative. So again, the sign of magnetic flux is actually dependent on your chosen area vector. So going back to Faraday's law, if we have this loop or conductor with ends A and B, and it has an area A, and we have a permanent magnet, this permanent magnet, can generate its own magnetic field and let's assume that this permanent magnet generates a steady magnetic field. In Faraday's law, notice that there must be a change in flux in order for us to have an EMF through this conductor. Right now, points A and B is at equal potential. Therefore, there's no potential difference between points A and B. Initially, if this is our conductor and this is our ma magnetic field, and they are stationary relative to each other, then the EMF between points A and B is zero, or the potential difference between points A and point B is zero. However, when I move this magnetic field or permanent magnet towards this loop or conducting loop, during the time I move this permanent magnet and hence the magnetic field through this loop, then during that time, there is a buildup of potential difference and there will be a measurable EMF between points A and B. Now, we call this EMF induced EMF because it's actually produced during the motion of this permanent magnet towards this conducting loop. Observe that when I move this permanent magnet towards this conducting loop, then there will be an induced EMF between points A and B. When I remove this magnet away from this conducting loop, there's also going to be an EMF or induced EMF through this loop. However, when I stop moving the permanent magnet again, then the EMF between points A and B drops to zero and there will be a zero induced EMF at this point. If this conducting loop is a closed loop, for example, I connect points A and B with a conductor, like a wire, then during the motion of this magnet towards this conducting closed loop and when I move it away, during that motion, since there will be an induced EMF between points A and B or throughout the loop, then there will also be an induced current since charges can now flow through the loop. Now the question is, what is the direction of this induced current. Again, when this conducting loop experiences a change in flux due to the motion of this permanent magnet, there will be an induced EMF and as a consequence, there will be an induced current. The direction of induced current is actually dictated by another law and 
this law is called Lenz's law. We will discuss it later, but for now, let me dissect further this Faraday's law. Let me expand Faraday's law by plugging in the definition of a flux or the magnetic flux. We can actually have a non-zero time derivative if either the magnetic field change or the area change or the relative direction between vector area of the conducting loop and external magnetic field. So in a way, it's not just the relative motion of the permanent magnet. We could actually, for example, if we focus on the time rate of change of magnetic field alone, imagine that this permanent magnet is stationary and this conducting loop is also stationary but for some unknown reason, this magnetic field increases on its own, then there will be an induced EMF through this conducting loop. On the other hand, if everything is constant except the area vector, remember that area vector is dependent on the magnitude of the area. So for example, in this setup again, we have a stationary permanent magnet and a stationary conducting loop but for some unknown reason, suddenly the area of this conducting loop increases. Later we will study a specific system where this is possible. So suddenly this area increases, then there will be an EMF induced in this conducting loop. And finally, if everything is constant, except with the relative direction between magnetic field vector and the area vector. For example, if I try to move this permanent magnet like this, then the direction between the dot product of the magnetic field vector and the area vector changes as well. And during this time, there will be an induced EMF. And if this is a closed loop, then there will be an induced current. So for now, notice that if I move the permanent magnet towards the conducting loop. Recall in our discussion of fields, when you have tightly spaced magnetic field vector, that means the strength of the magnetic field is greater than this region because here we have less magnetic field vector passing through this region. So in a way, when I move the permanent magnet towards the conducting loop, the area vector now experiences greater number of magnetic field line and hence the strength of the magnetic field actually increases during this motion. So this is where the time rate of change of magnetic flux comes in. Let's now discuss the direction of the induced current. Now Lenz's law states that during the induction process, the direction of the induced current is such as to oppose the cause of change in magnetic flux. This is our Faraday's law and Lenz's law actually refers to the negative sign in Faraday's law. For example, this is our conducting loop and this is our source of magnetic flux, this permanent magnet here. Now let me position this permanent magnet like this. Okay. So I can actually draw this permanent magnet towards this conducting loop this way. So, but before that, recall that if we focus our attention on this conducting loop, if this conducting loop has a current that flows in this manner, then using the right-hand rule that I presented in my previous lectures, the magnetic field produced by this conducting loop looks like this. However, when current flows on the opposite direction, if we are looking in top view, the current is flowing in counterclockwise direction, then the magnetic field produced by this conducting loop points generally downwards. So let's now return to our system. Lenz's law tells us that the direction of the induced current is such as to oppose the cause of the change in flux. So for example, if I try to push down this magnet towards our conducting loop, then during this motion, when I push this magnet downwards, 
During this motion, the conducting loop experiences an increase in magnetic flux because remember, this region of the magnet is getting closer towards our conducting loop. Hence, during this time when I push the permanent magnet downwards or towards the conducting loop, the conducting loop experiences an increase in magnetic flux. Therefore, its response is to produce its own magnetic flux in such a way to oppose this increasing external magnetic flux. So therefore, the conducting loop must produce a magnetic flux that looks like this. In order to oppose the increasing magnetic flux during this motion, this conducting loop must produce its own magnetic field in such a way to oppose this increasing magnetic flux. And in order to do this, this conducting loop must produce an induced current that looks like this. So therefore, the direction of the induced current is clockwise if you view it in top view. So in a way, Lenz's law is used to predict the direction of current by observing how the magnetic flux is changing. So what if our permanent magnet reaches this position and then suddenly I decided to pull this permanent magnet upwards. So during this motion, since I'm pulling the magnet upwards, the conducting loop is experiencing a decrease in magnetic flux since we are essentially moving away the source of the magnetic flux. So during this time, the conducting loop must oppose this change in flux. So in a way, it must produce a magnetic field that points this way. Because somehow the conducting loop must maintain this number of magnetic field lines but since I'm moving the permanent magnet away from the conducting loop it experiences a change in flux in such a way the magnetic field lines is decreasing per unit time. To resist this change in flux the conducting loop must produce its own magnetic flux in such a way it will resist this decreasing change in flux. So in order to do this there must be a current or an induced current in the loop that points in this direction. This is how Lenz's law is used to predict the direction of the induced current when a conducting loop experiences a change in magnetic flux. Let's try to apply Faraday's law by solving some problems. This problem came from OpenStax University Physics Volume 2, Chapter 13, Problem Number 31. A rectangular wire loop with length A and width B lies in the xy plane as shown in this figure. Within the loop, there is a time-dependent magnetic field given by B of t equals C times x cosine omega t i hat plus C times y sine omega t k hat where the magnetic field is in Tesla. So C here is a constant. Determine the EMF induced in the loop as a function of time. In the problem, I hat, K hat, J hat are similar to our usage of X hat, Y hat, J hat. So essentially, they are unit vectors. So if this is the X axis, this is the direction of I hat. And if this is the Y axis, then this is the direction of J hat. And if this is the Z axis, apparently this is the direction of positive k hat. So based on this given alone, notice that a magnetic field has a component going to i hat and another component going to k hat. In a way, magnetic field points this way. So to calculate the EMF induced, notice that if we try to write down the equation of Faraday's law, Since we only have one loop, conducting loop, then n equals 1. So I'll just write 1 or it is understood that there is a factor of 1 here. Since the magnetic flux is the dot product of magnetic field vector and area vector, and since the magnetic field is time dependent, then we have a non-zero EMF. So before we calculate the induced EMF, let's calculate first the magnetic flux that passes through this area. So the definition of magnetic flux is the integral of B dotted to dA. 
we have an expression for the vector b and it's already given here the area here essentially is the area of our rectangular wire loop because this is the system under study if we start with the infinitesimal area da then this is equal to an infinitesimal area of this loop and since we have a rectangular coordinate system we use the infinitesimal element dx and infinitesimal element dy now here remember that when you have an area you can always represent it with two direction we can represent the positive area vector going to positive k hat or going to negative k hat for this example let's just choose the positive direction of the area vector to be positive k hat so calculating this integral that product to our da which is dx dy k hat from vector algebra k hat dotted to i hat equals zero so this entire term will be zero when we perform the dot product now k hat dotted to k hat is equal to one so after performing the dot product this is the only term that will be retained and since our integration path is divided into dx and dy let me write two integral signs here so this is the only term that is retained this factor and this factor are constant with respect to our integral so i'll put them outside the integral sign the integral of dx is evaluated from zero to this length which is a and the integral of y dy is evaluated from zero to this length which is b So evaluating the integral, we have the following expression. So let me plug this expression back to our expression for Faraday's law to get the EMF induced. Since these are all constant with respect to our time derivative, I'll put them outside the derivative. The derivative of sine omega t is cosine omega t times omega. EMF equals negative a b squared c omega over 2 times cosine omega t. This problem is from OpenStax University Physics, Volume 2, Chapter 13, Problem Number 35. The magnetic flux through the loop shown in the accompanying figure, so this is the figure, varies with time according to phi sub m equals 2.00 times e raised to negative 3t sine of 120pi t, where phi sub m or the magnetic flux is in milliweber. What are the direction and magnitude of the current through the 5 ohm resistor? So this is the resistor. At t equals 0 or time equals 0 and b, t equals 2.17 times 10 raised to negative 2 second. Part c, t equals or time equals 3.00 seconds. Now in the figure, this loop, circular loop, let's assume that it is perfectly circular, is actually submerged in a magnetic field that is out of the page so essentially the magnetic field vectors are moving towards us to calculate the magnitude of current and direction we use ohm's law remember ohm's law is v equals ir so to get current we just divide the potential at the resistor v with the resistance and this potential difference across the resistor is actually the induced EMF due to this changing magnetic flux. To calculate the current, we must first calculate the induced EMF through this circuit. Let's derive the expression for EMF before calculating the current. Using Faraday's law, E equals negative N dphi over dt. 
we only have one loop, therefore n equals 1. Since n refers to the number of loops, it is understood that there is a factor 1 in this expression. So we have 2.00 times e raised to negative 3 times t sine. Now in the given, this is 120 pi t. For easier notation, I'll just temporarily write 120 pi as omega. Then I'll just plug 120 pi back later during actual numerical calculations. Let me plug the value of omega, which is 120 pi. In part A, we would like to determine the value of the EMF at time equals 0. Now note that my cosine and sine here has an argument that is not in angle or that is not in degrees. Therefore, you must convert the function of your calculator into radian. So you need to change degrees of your scientific calculator into radians. If I plug t equals 0 in this expression, I'll end up with negative 2 40 pi. Now, if our magnetic flux, let me return to this. If our magnetic flux here is in milliweber, then essentially it must have a factor times 10 raised to negative 3 Weber. So it has a unit of times 10 raised to negative 3 Weber if it is in milliweber. And this factor times 10 raised to negative 3 will be carried out throughout the entire calculations. Technically, this is in millivolts if our magnetic flux is in milliweber. To get the current, I equals potential difference over R. I'll just use the magnitude for now and explain the meaning of negative sign here later. 2, 4 divided by 5.0 ohm and therefore I equals 0 0.15 ampere if our flux is in milliweber and current is equal to 150 amperes if our flux is in Weber. Next, how about the direction of this current? Is it flowing this way downward through the resistor or is it going upward through the resistor. Now to determine the direction, let's look at the sign of our EMF. It's negative. Remember that our Faraday's law here, let me rewrite it. E equals, actually this Faraday's law can be written as negative 1 times d phi over dt. If the magnetic flux is increasing, then this d phi over dt is positive. Positive times negative equals negative. Now if this d phi over dt is decreasing, then d phi over dt has an intrinsic negative sign. Okay, if it is decreasing. Sorry. So negative times negative equals positive. But our results tells us that the resulting EMF is negative. Therefore, this must be increasing. In order to be consistent with our result, d phi over dt must be positive. In other words, the magnetic flux must be increasing. Since we know, based on the result of EMF, that the magnetic flux is increasing through this loop at time equals zero, if this is increasing, using Lenz's law, this loop must produce a flux that goes in this direction, uh, opposite to the external magnetic field. So it must produce a magnetic field that is into the page. And in order to do that, the current must flow in this direction, right? Therefore, if current flows in this direction, then the current flows through the resistor downwards. So that's the answer here. So this current actually flows downward through the resistor. So in part B, we are asked to calculate the induced EMF at time t equals 2.17 times 10 raised to negative 2 seconds. Plugging in the numerical values, we have positive 232.06. This is in volts or millivolts depending on the units of our magnetic flux. Using 
ohm's law we can calculate the induced current that flows through the resistor with resistance r plugging in the values i equals 46.41 ampere if our flux is in weber otherwise the induced current is equal to 0 0.04 46 ampere if the magnetic flux is in milliweber. Now to determine the direction whether it's downward or upward, notice that we have a positive EMF. Therefore, to be consistent with our result, this term here must be negative, meaning to say this flux here must be a decreasing flux to yield a negative sign in this time derivative. So this must be decreasing to produce a negative sign and negative times negative is equal to positive. So we establish the fact that at time t equals 2.17 times 10 raised to negative 2 seconds, the magnetic flux is decreasing. If currently the magnetic field lines is out of the page and it is decreasing, in order to resist that decrease in magnetic flux, this loop must produce a magnetic field that is also out of the page because it's actually resisting this decrease in flux. In order to produce a magnetic field that is out of the page, it must have an induced current in this direction. If we trace this path, the current must flow through the resistor upwards. This current is actually moving upward through the resistor. For part C, we would like to evaluate the induced EMF at time equals 3.00 seconds. And plugging in 3 in this expression, we have EMF equals negative 0.093 and current is equal to 0.019 ampere if the magnetic flux is in Weber. Otherwise, the current is equal to 1.9 times 10 raised to negative 5 ampere if the magnetic flux is in milliweber. So since our EMF is negative, using the same reasoning we used in part A, This current is actually moving downward through the resistor. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and hit the notification bell button for awesome updates. Thank you for watching.